Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks to MLA uh, for the invitation to speak today and also for funding the work that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, and, and thanks also to Hayley for organising uh, today's event. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, especially when you're dealing with recalcitrant presenters like myself and making sure we get to the right place at the right time and all those things. So thanks, Hayley. Um, so we started working with MLA on uh, goat nutrition uh, back at the end of 2018. And, and since then, I've had uh, the opportunity to um, talk at a few goat webinars and a few field days uh, out in southwest West Queensland over the last couple of years. And there's been lots and lots of interest, lots of people turn up. Um, they've been good fun, um, really enjoyed that. And, and lots of really, really good questions. Um, so I think, um, I know I'm preaching to the converted a little bit, but um, it's a really um, exciting time for the goat industry. And there's a real lot of good energy, positive energy about the industry. And um, a, lot of, a lot of hunger for um, new information on how to develop and refine uh, these goat production systems uh, as, as you know, the, the whole industry is evolving really quickly with new people coming in and more sophisticated production and marketing um, systems developing. Um, so yeah, it's been really good. And I apologize to those people that have heard me talk before. Um, I'm going to be giving a very similar presentation. And unfortunately, um, I still don't have any uh, silver bullets for you all, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's been really good work and um, I've, I've found that uh, I tend to learn more from uh, the producers and the questions they ask than, and, than they probably learn from us. So um, I'll get on with it, eh? So, uh, Reza gave a really nice uh, introduction to um, supplementation and an overview of that. And, and I just wanted to add a couple of things to, to his discussion before I get into our research and, and some of the earlier research on supplementation uh, on rangeland goats. And I think it's important at the outset, and as Reza said, to, to understand that not everyone needs to supplement their goats all the time. It's all based on you know, energy flow and energy balance. And, um, supplementation is just about making sure that the animals have got the, the right nutrient uh, intake at the right time to meet their product production targets that you've got in place. And sometimes there are other management strategies that are available um, to producers uh, rather than supplementation. But if we are thinking about supplementation, then the, the first questions that we need to ask is, uh, are our goats getting enough nutrients to meet their requirements? And, and if they're not, what is the likely response to supplementation if we provide those supplements to them? And so to get that information about the nutrient requirements, typically we'd go to um, published feeding standards and these types of things, and that's the Australian standards there. And uh, unfortunately, there's limited goat specific content in these standards. Um, you know, a lot of the information is based on sheep um, and we know a sheep's not a goat. So uh, it makes it difficult to know exactly what the nutrient requirements are for, for goats. Internationally, there's also goat specific feeding standards, but the context is different. You know, sometimes it's based on dairy goats, sometimes based on loosely defined indigenous goats and things like that. Um, so we really do need some good, locally relevant derived data um, for our own conditions. So uh, I think the fact that MLA and GERDAC and industry uh, are investing in local, good local research is really important at the moment. So how do we, how do we know if we're going to get a response to supplementation on our farm at a local level? And I guess the, the first thing we can do is to look at what we do with our other species. If we supplement and see a response with our cattle and sheep, then potentially we'll see a response with our goats. At least we'll know that there is potentially a nutrient deficiency uh, there. Um, of course, goats have different grazing behaviour and different nutrient requirements. So 
We don't know that they will respond to a supplement and we don't know the extent of that response that we might see. We could look at previous experience in our own observation. So we can look at animal behaviour. Do we see signs of goats chewing bones, eating dirt, stripping bark off tree? These might all be signs of a nutrient deficiency for the goats. We talk to our neighbours and see if they're supplementing and what sort of responses they see when they give a supplement to their goats. And ultimately, as producers, we can set up our own on-farm trials and test these things ourselves. And my experience is that producers are usually the best scientists out there because they just get to the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. They develop really practical um, solutions to setting up a, a, a simple trial and get the results that they want to make a decision that they need. Um, so that's the other option. We can look at sample analysis. Um, a soil sample test will tell us if there's a nutrient deficiency in the soil. It won't tell us what sort of response we'll get if, from a goat if we address that deficiency. We can take samples from the animals. The problem with this is that we may not have goat specific reference data or calibrations. So all we would know is that what the, the level of phosphorus in the plasma is, for example, um, but we don't know it, what extent response we will get if we provide a supplement. And we could collect samples of the diet and analyse those as well. But it's very difficult to sample a diet that's representative of what uh, a goat is selecting, particularly out in the, in the rangeland environment. So as, as Reza said, you know, um, when, do we, when do we supplement our goats? And he talked about the seasonal feed supply and, and those things. I was just going to talk about another issue and, and um, that's the one of uh, day length. So for those of you that don't know, goats are photoperiod sensitive. And, and as we know, uh, you know, day length or, or hours of sunlight a day decreases as we move from uh, the summer solstice in late December through to winter um, and I've just plotted out there a range of um, uh, day lengths uh, across a range of regions where there's potentially goats at the moment um, so going from about 14 hours day length a day in December down to 10 10 and a half uh, in winter and then increasing again after that um, so it's about a four hour change in day length uh, across the year so why am I talking about day length? Well, typically, observations are that we see a reduction in um, productivity during the cooler months of the year. And, and this is commonly referred to as winter stasis. Um, and this has you know, previously been related to the availability and quality of pastures, parasites, cold temperatures, and all these factors might be confounding here. Um, but under controlled conditions, uh, we know that photo period itself is, is, has a direct effect on feed intake and live weight gain. The figure here on the left is with some, uh, some bucks. Um, and you can see uh, fed two different diets. So a medium quality pangola grass hay and a high quality loosen uh, grass hay, loosen hay, sorry. Um, and we can see during the early win uh, late winter spring period, uh, rapid increase in live weight gain that then plateaus off during December, January, uh, February. And then once we get to the autumn equinox here, we actually see a, a reduction in live weight before as day length starts to increase again, live weight gain increases. And, and this work was done under controlled conditions. So in an animal house, um, controlled diets, no internal parasites. It was in northeast New South Wales, so it wasn't overly cold. Um, and a similar trend for both diets. So this is an indication that photo period itself is driving this. And this response is related to a reduction in intake, which then results in a reduction in weight gain. So the question then is, would you be supplementing during this period where you're getting significant weight loss due to photo period um, or is there a management decision here that can be made, which might be actually to sell your goats before that period of time? Can we use supplementation to address this issue? Uh, the figure on the right uh, is with wiener goats. Uh, the red dotted line there is the 
autumn equinox. And these goats were either not supplemented, the black line here, or offered a, um, a range of other supplements, molasses or protein meals. And you can see the loss of live weight when the goats were unsupplemented or offered a molasses supplement. Um, whereas if they were offered a protein supplement, the loss of weight was alleviated somewhat, but certainly it wasn't a, a production response. They didn't gain weight by giving a supplement over that period. So the question there is really, you know, do we invest in supplementation during that period of the year? Um, do we sell our goats before we get to that period if they're at market weight? Or do we just accept a small weight loss and supplement after that when day length is increasing and we try and capture the benefits of compensatory gain when we know they're going to be eating more uh, if the pasture is available? So quite an interesting uh, question there. What class of goats uh, should we supplement? Again, drawing on some of the old literature, and there's, there's, there is a lot of really good old literature there from the 70s and 80s that probably should be dusted off and pulled into extension materials if it's not already, already done so. Um, the figure on the, on the left there uh, shows kid live weight um, there, and they were kids that were born to does that received different supplementation strategies during pregnancy. So again, the black line, those does received no supplement during pregnancy. Uh, the orange line, they received a supplement between day 60 and 90, day 90, 120, 120, and 150, and so on. This, this is the weight gain of those kids after birth. So they were born, uh, very little difference in birth weights in those kids, but you can see the large uh, difference in weight of those kids at weaning. Uh, in response to uh, supplementation during pregnancy. And, and in this case, that, that response is probably driven by um, a colostrum and milk production early in, in their uh, after birth. Um, and what's really interesting is that those changes, uh, those differences in weaning weight uh, persist pretty well right through until about 10 months of age in that particular study. The other, the other option, I guess, is looking at um, supplementation of the kid. And we can look at that before and after weaning. Again, weaning is the red line here. Um, so in this work, the black line, again, these kids received no supplement before weaning or after weaning. The blue line, the kids received supplementation for four weeks before weaning and four weeks after weaning. So you can see a, a benefit there from the, the cumulative effects of that total period of supplementation. Um, and then these other two lines received supplements basically after weaning and a little bit before. So again, there is a response to supplementation after weaning as we would expect, but a, a bigger response if they received supplements before and after weaning. So everyone's probably stressing, right? Like I'm saying you've got to supplement goats all the time and, and that's not what I'm saying at all. This is just a range of um, scenarios where there's, there is some data to suggest what the benefits of supplementation would be. Um, and really it's up to the individual um, situation and the economics of these things as to when the, the greatest return on investment might be for a producer. So that kind of feeds into our project that we, we finished, finished late last year. Um, and it was about determining the response of rangeland goats to um, supplements. And when we started this work, um, the issue that we were faced with or our brief was to look at the response of young underweight goats. And, and at that time, underweight goats were of no commercial value. Um, so our target was young bucks that were 15 to 20 kilograms. And we were looking solely at rangeland bucks um, because these were the ones that industry deemed to be a, an issue. So a producer musters all their goats in and anything that's light couldn't go on the truck. So what do they do with them then? Can we use supplementation to get them up to market weights? It's not, not the issue that it 
was anymore because the market specs have changed a bit, I think. So we ran a number of experiments. Uh, all of our experiments were ran during September to December. Um, so we avoided that photo period effect. Uh, all our goats were in individual indoor pens. So we could get individual intake data. We could control the amount of supplement they got. Um, and we could measure individual weight and all the other parameters we measured. In all of our experiments, we fed Mitchell grass hay as a low quality base diet. And you can see there it was pretty, pretty low, but that's typical of the dry season across Northern Australia. Um, so it was a fairly representative industry relevant feed for Northern Australia. The supplements that we trialed, cottonseed meal, whole cottonseed, loosened chaff, urea, molasses mix, rolled wheat, rolled sorghum, loosened pellets, and uh, a range of uh, um, other commercial pellets. In all these experiments, some goats didn't receive a supplement and uh, they basically maintained weight um, when they were just fed the Mitchell grass alone. In, in picking these supplements, whenever we meet producers, they always say, oh, why didn't you try this or that? And, and they're all good questions and they're all locally relevant um, feeds, of course. Um, but within the constraints of the budget and time, we couldn't test every possible supplement. So we, we identified feeds that at the time we thought were geographically or regionally relevant around the cotton industry, I guess, um, or were representative of types of feed. So lucerne as a legume, for example, cottonseed meal as a protein meal, wheat as a highly available starch source and sorghum a little bit lower and, and those types of things. So we, we acknowledge we couldn't test everything, but we tried to test uh, as broad a range as possible uh, in these experiments. So without pulling together all the data, um, this is the key uh, kind of output for us. And, and what we've got here is for all of the supplements that we detected a response to. And by that, I mean, we saw an increase in live weight gain in response to an increase in the amount of supplement the goats consumed. So along the horizontal axis here, we have actual supplement intake. And on the vertical axes, we have average daily gain above our unsupplemented goats in each of these experiments. And there were four experiments um, with a large number of supplements. And you can see here the different sorts of response lines that we get, response equations. So goats fed the loosened chaff and loosened pellets, had a lower live weight gain as then ones fed the wheat, which was lower again than the ones fed the commercial pellets that we bought. The response to cottonseed meal here is very typical of a response of a ruminant to a protein meal where you see a, a, a very um, uh, significant response early at low levels of supplementation. But as that um, supplement level increases, uh, the, the response in terms of live weight gain plateaus a little bit. I might skip over that. That's just intake data that shows uh, increasing total intake in response to supplements going this way. But what happens to our Mitchell grass, and, and Reza was talking about this, as we increase the energy intake, energy supplement intake, our intake of Mitchell grass actually drops away. So it's about finding that, that threshold between utilizing the our cheapest available feed resource, which is the pasture base, versus um, the response we're going to get from putting more uh, supplements in. So now I'm just gonna to have to jump out and hopefully this works. Someone will tell me if it hasn't. So we used all the, all good? All good, Simon. Thank you. So we used all that information to develop this calculator and it's not available just yet, but um, I've just been given some instruction on how we're going to get it branded and posted online soon. 
the idea is that producers don't have to do too much work here. Um, what we're going to do, and I'm going to just give some, a demonstration, is we're going to put our starting live weight of our goat. What's our target live weight? 25 kilograms. So we want to put 10 kilograms on these goats. Producers do need to know what the approximate cost of their supplements might be per tonne delivered to their farm. So this is not going to tell us profitability or anything like that. It is purely telling us the relative cost of each supplement to achieve our target and how long it will take to get there. Um, so I'm going to throw, so after saying all you need to know is the cost of supplements, I have no idea. Um, so I'm going to put some numbers here. Um, Uh, now, the other thing we need to do is put in what our uh, additional growth rate that we want to see above our unsupplemented controls. We, we have to use biologically relevant and real data. Um, and the data that we've put, I put limits on this so that we can only enter data within the range that our experiments tested and the responses we got. So to make it easy, I've put the maximum values there that you can enter in here. So for example, for loose and chaff, we have to put 50. If we put 60, we'll get a big red flag there that says that's not biologically possible. So what I'll do is I'll just put in approximately the maximum amounts here. So they're the maximum amounts of additional growth that we, we measured in our trial. Run across here, we've got a whole range of calculations. Probably this one's pretty important. How much supplement will those goats need per day to achieve that growth rate there? You can follow those down. How much will it cost per day, cents per day to do that? And how much would it cost per additional kilogram of live weight gain? So that's all fine. The two really important ones are on the end here. So what's it going to cost to reach that target of ours, 25 kilograms, that extra 10 kilograms? And how long is it going to take? And so even though, and I can bump this up a bit, 750, even though, the pellets, for example, are quite expensive compared to the other supplements. The total cost to get that extra 10 kilograms on our goat is about the same as the wheat and the sorghum in this, in this model. And it's going to take us half the time. And that's purely because that growth response means that they're growing twice as fast, well, not twice as fast, but probably 50% uh, quicker. So it means that they're going to reach that target sooner which means the total amount of supplement required is less and the number of days is less. So it becomes a decision about, do you wanna go for the cheapest supplement as purchased, the cheapest amount to get your animals to the target or turn them off the quickest? And, and they're sort of the management decisions that um, producers uh, can make with this tool, I guess, I hope. Um, I'm gonna jump back in now. So that's looking at the, the numbers, the hard numbers, that's fine. Um, some people like to look at these things visually. Um, and so that this figure is generated in there. I've put in some thresholds there. So if, we, if our target is 75 grams a day, um, we can see that the loose and, and um, cottonseed meal supplements won't actually achieve that. Um, and you can see that the pellets and wheat are going to cost you about 10 cents a day, the sorghum about 15 cents a day to achieve that. Um, if we push out to a 100 gram a day target, well, uh, only the pellet and the wheat uh, will reach that in terms of the supplements we tested um, with not much difference between them, a couple of cents. And I appreciate a couple of cents adds up when you're feeding a thousand goats uh, over a uh, hundred days. So it, it, these small margins uh, multiply out pretty quickly, I know that. The other way to look at it is, of course, if we wanted to allocate a budget of 15 cents per day, how would that best be used? Uh, which supplement's going to give us the greatest return on the investment? So there's all sorts of ways you can look at this data.
The other thing that we're able to do is um, collate all our data and look at some of these more basic nutritional requirements. So this one is around the energy requirements for goats. And we talked about some of these different feeding standards that are available. This is the American system here. And, and they have a maintenance uh, energy requirement of around 500 uh, kilojoules per kilogram metabolic weight. Don't worry about the uh, terms, that's just scientific jargon. We like to overcomplicate things uh, as nutritionists, um, but it's the, it's the levels and responses that are important. In our data, you know, we found that it was closer to 400 and that aligns pretty well with some work from the 80s by Barry Norton and Andrew Ash, uh, where we got this same threshold here. So this is what I mean about just making sure that we're using locally relevant uh, data in our uh, calculations for nutrient requirements. This, this figure is in the final report uh, and that's available online. This is protein requirements. It's also in the final report. So one of the things just to wrap that up about the supplementation is that We've established some principles here and we've developed the calculator, but really I think it requires validation under commercial conditions. Um, Melanie mentioned the PDS um, call at the moment, and I think this is a great opportunity for a number of producers to, to get together and think about establishing a PDS around supplementation. We've got a whole range of variables there that could be considered. Um, it's... It's not my uh, business to form a group or anything like that, but if there's people interested and, and they're looking for a bit of advice on how you might set up a, a PDS site and what sort of data to collect, um, happy to take any calls or any emails. My details are at the back end of the talk here today. Uh, just wrapping up pretty quickly, I'm sure I'm nearly out of time. Um, the um, at the end of all our supplementation trials, we're actually faced with the same issue as the producers in that we had a whole bunch of underweight goats uh, because some of those goats didn't get any supplement and some got very little. Um, so what we did was we uh, took the opportunity and, and put them in uh, group pens and um, tried to finish them out to, to market weight uh, at the time. And, and probably uh, equally interesting compared as, as the supplementation work that we did. Um, oops, sorry, skip back. So at the end of the first experiment here on the left, we, we just split the goats in half um, and we gave half of them uh, access to a pellet, a commercial pellet and half of them access to loosened hay from a feeder. Both groups had access to a low quality roughage source just for uh, rumination. Um, and you see the responses we got there, up to 200 grams a day when they had ad lib access to the pellets and about 130 grams a day when they had access to the um, loosen. What's really interesting though is the huge variation that we saw here. And you can see down the bottom there, you know, these goats, under these conditions ranged from 100 grams a day up to 300 grams a day. And there's, for sure there's behavioral issues there as well as genetic variation influencing that. We saw the same huge variation in the individual pens as well uh, in terms of their supplement and Mitchell grass hay intake. So the second time we did this, we, we split them into heavy and light groups and fed both groups the same pellet as over here. Um, we used a three day adaptation, a three week adaptation period, sorry. Um, and you see their growth rates were a little bit lower there, but once they were on full ad lib feeding again with their lighter goats, at least, we were hitting up around that 200 grams a day uh, mark. Again, significant variation, you know, between well, zero up to 250 grams a day uh, for these goats. It's not a huge number there, it's about 60 or 80 goats in each of these um, experiments. And again, we similar sort of result here, we had them split them into light and heavy groups. Um, the heavy group this time performed slightly better. Um, back here, the, uh, the light group performed slightly better. 
Um, again, huge variation. Indiv each of those points is an individual goat. So huge individual variation under identical conditions, group feeding. Um, so repeatable responses to a starch pellet, um, one to 1 1.4 kilograms per week after adaptation. Uh, the, um, it was pretty repeatable for us. We didn't have any individual intake data, um, but the, the actual weight gains were pretty repeatable at an average level across the groups. The responses though were highly variable uh, and you can see that there. I've, most of our work before this was, was with cattle and, and we had a lot to learn about the goats, particularly when we put them out in the group, uh, group pens. Uh, and that was really interesting. Um, every day they were up to something different and, and we had to learn on the run um, and we we're doing modifications to um, how we segregated them, how we moved them together, how we fed them, you know, modifying hay feeders, trialling all sorts of things having you know, different sort of enrichment in the pens. Um, so it's really good. Um, probably a few little practical tips there and i um, happy to talk to others who probably have more experience in this space than us, um, uh, but we're happy to share out what we learned and what we tried as well. So summing up, um, what did we achieve? Well. We de we, we've determined the, some responses of rangeland goats to protein and energy supplements, but really this, the next step now is to, for validation under grazing conditions. Um, I, th I just wanted to point out that specific goat mineral requirements are, are largely unknown. We currently use sheep estimates as far as I know in Australia. We've developed a calculator that'll be available on the MLA website soon. Um, I think we're pretty confident that the potential growth rates of rangeland goats in intensive feeding systems, we can get one to 1 1.4 kilograms per week. Um, I want to point out that that's rangelands. I'm, I'm sure you will get far more with your boar and other meat breeds um, as well. We saw a large variation in response, whether that was in the individual pens or the group pens. Uh, whether there's an opportunity there for genetic selection of better doers within the rangeland goat herd or not, um, it's an interesting question. And finally, I also wanted to give a shout out to GERDAC. Um, Melanie introduced them. I found them to be a really, really enthusiastic group, really supportive of our research, um, really interested in it and, and great listeners. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's got any ideas for research or even wants to get involved in GERDAC um, to look them up. I think Melanie put the details there. Um, I certainly found it a really great group to work with. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, there's my details there. I'd like to give another shout out to um, our team, uh, the GOATs, the greatest of all time there. Um, Really fortunate to work with Nick Perkins, uh, Kath and Locke Watts and Trish and Jim McKenzie. They sold us goats to spec for all of our trials. And we had a large team involved at UQ that were involved in all these studies as well. So heads up to them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon. That was a really great presentation. And I think you summed it up really nicely, the importance of, of research and how it can have a really great impact um, with meaningful outcomes that can be applied to a, to a producer level. So thanks very much for your great insight and, and wonderful presentation.